Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Kimberly, can you call roll, please? Here. 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 We will now observe our customary moment of silence. And that would you lead us in the pledge, please? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Members of the audience may address the board on agenda items only. We're good there? We're good. Okay. We're good at this. Okay, we will move to report of the superintendent, special recognition hires. I was going to try to do this all in one breath, but I don't think I'm going yeah, to be careful with that. Uh, to begin with, let's start about new hires. Um, I don't have the specifications behind where they're at, but I'll just read this out. Do I have it? Oh, thank you. Where did I put that? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Is it turning? Yeah. Thank you. I don't think I can move on. Must be. Must be. Oh, sorry. Here we go. We have a lot of new hires. Um, Shannon Altick fills the position of special education paraprofessional at Marshall High School. Ms. Altick is a graduate of Marshall High School and has attended Northern Michigan University. Leroy Brown Bell fills the position of Hall Monitor at Harrington Elementary. Mr. Bell is a graduate of Albion High School. Andrew Burt fills the position of third grade teacher at Harrington Elementary. Andrew attended Shawnee State University where he earned a bachelor's degree with a major in social science. He also attended Wayne State University where he obtained a master's degree with a major in instructional technology. Sharon Bolin fills the position of first grade teacher at Harrington Elementary. Sharon attended Central Michigan University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in integrative science and a minor in reading. Kalani Burkhard fills the position of English teacher at Marshall High School. Kalani attended Western Michigan University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in English and a minor in history. Stephanie Greenman fills the position of special education teacher at Marshall High School. Stephanie attended Metropolitan State College in Denver, Colorado where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in elementary education and a minor in special education. She also attended the University of Northern Arizona where she obtained her master's degree <coughs> with a major in reading. Karen Hall fills the position of special education teacher at Walters Elementary. Karen attended Ball State University, where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in elementary education. She also attended Western Michigan University, where she obtained her master's degree with a major in educational leadership. Jill Higgins fills the position of first grade teacher at Harrington Elementary. Jill attended Spring Arbor University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in elementary education and a minor in Spanish. She also earned her master's degree through Spring Arbor University with a major in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Kim Little fills the position of paraprofessional at Marshall Middle School. Ms. Little is a graduate of the University of Houston where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in interdisciplinary studies. Amanda Lynn fills the position of second grade teacher at Hughes Elementary. Amanda attended Western University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in education. Eleanor Marsh fills the position of library technician at Marshall Middle School. Ms. Marsh is a graduate of Hanover College where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in music and a minor in math. She obtained her master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a focus in arts administration. Sorry. Billy McKinsey fills the position of special education paraprofessional at Marshall High School. Ms. McKinsey is a graduate of Tusculum College where she earned a bachelor's degree 
with a major in history and a minor in museum studies. Jennifer Myers fills the position of cook at Harrington Elementary. Ms. Myers is a graduate of Shepherd High School. Christina Rincon fills the position of instructional monitor at the Michigan Youth Challenge Academy Job Challenge. Ms. Rincon received her bachelor's degree from Indiana University with a major in elementary education and a minor in Spanish. Ms. Rincon also obtained her master's degree in educational leadership from Western Michigan University. Madeline Samra fills the position of paraprofessional at Harrington Elementary. Ms. Samra is a graduate of Marshall High School. Alan Sherwood fills the position of sixth grade teacher at Marshall Middle School. Alan attended Spring Arbor University where he earned a bachelor's degree with a major in elementary education. He also graduated from Western Michigan University where he earned his master's degree in educational leadership. Raymond Stone fills the position of paraprofessional at Harrington Elementary. Mr. Stone is a graduate of Marshall High School. He recently graduated from Kellogg Community College with an associate's degree in human services. Marticia Walls fills the position of paraprofessional at Harrington Elementary. Ms. Walls is a graduate of Albion High School. She attended Baker College where she earned her associate degree with a major in early childhood education. Philip O'Neill Warnsley Jr. fills the position of paraprofessional at Harrington Elementary. Mr. Warnsley is a graduate of Albion High School. He recently graduated from Mid-Michigan Community College with an associate's degree in a major in, with a major in, in accounting. Colleen Williams fills the position of fifth grade teacher at Hughes Elementary. Colleen attended Michigan State University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in education. She also earned her master's degree through Michigan State University with a major in teaching curriculum. Finally, MSU was mentioned. <laughs> Miriam Wisniewski is, fills the position of sixth grade teacher at Marshall Middle School. Miriam graduated from Grand Valley State University where she earned a bachelor's degree with a major in social studies. Those are all the new hires. Notice how many times I said earn their master's degree. Mm -hmm. And that's just awesome. We have a really strong um, uh, tenor of new teachers coming in. We're really excited about the, the adventures we're gonna have this year. All right, now at our um, welcome back breakfast, one of my um, pleasures is to give out two awards and one of those is a Golden Apple Award. And for that, I'm going to step to the podium a second. In absentia, Miss Elizabeth Carey stood up and accepted this award on behalf of our recipient. So I'm going to reread our statement of award and have this gentleman come up and join us, all right? It is a pleasure on an annual basis to recognize a community member or members who have been especially supportive of our schools. This gentleman is an outstanding example of the commitment members of our community have for our school district. His dedication to the Marshall Public Schools is demonstrated time and again. He is one of the original owners, now co-owner and president of Team One Plastics <laughs> Inc., an incredible plastics molding and injections company right here in Albion. During the mid-80s, he and two other partners began incubating their business concepts into an award-winning company. And boy, have they received awards. Just six years after incorporating in 1987 as Team One Plastics, they received the award in 1993 as the fastest growing private company in the United States. They have received the distinction as best places to work in plastics in the United States and Canada three years in a row. Multiple silver awards for distinguished safety culminating in the Gold Award for Safety in 2016. I tell you just a sampling of such distinctions because they illustrate the kind of climate and culture Team One Plastics has created for their team members. And after meeting and working with this gentleman for the past eight years, I know he played a large role in building such integrity and trust within his company. By now you may have guessed the identity of this year's Golden Apple recipient because you probably heard it already, <laughs> or you know that he's sitting in the audience. <laughs> Craig Carroll. So Craig, could you come on up for a second? And I'm going to finish out this report. All right. Let me share a bit more about Craig's contributions. Well, uh, well, 
Anyways, Craig NT1 Plastics was the initial sponsor of our robotics program. He is an integral, uh, inaugural member of the Skilled Trades and Engineering Partnership with a lot of push and personal drive that he gave me to move things along and get more organized, supporting our efforts in career and technical education. He has influenced the district's approach to helping our graduates become career ready and has invested his resources of time, talent, and treasures in this regard. Just to underscore T1 Plastic's commitment and dedication to our young people and the schools that serve them in our communities, they were recognized by the Albion Community Schools in 1997 as Business Partner of the Year. So he's had a long legacy of contribution to schools. T1 Plastics Inc. has just celebrated their 30th anniversary, and in the video they launched to commemorate this great accomplishment, T1 showcased the Marshall Public Schools Red Hot Chili Box robotic, Robotics Program and the STEP Program as prime examples of how they value their connection to the communities in which they belong. Please help me again to celebrate Craig Carroll from T1 Plastics as a recipient of this year's 2017 Golden Apple Award for exemplary service in support of our schools and the community. One more time, let's give him a round of applause. You can put that back in the box. Or Make sure we don't damage it. Would you like to say a few words? If you don't mind. <laughs> Never turn up a time to talk about Team One, but really, thank you, Randy, and the Marshall School Board for this honor of receiving this prestigious award. It really is um, meant for Team One Plastics, even though I know I receive it. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without the partnership I have with my equal business partner, Gary Drogowski. We started the business, as Randy mentioned, 30 years ago. And we've always been committed from day one to be a positive community member. We talk about it in our championship dream, our mission vision statement. And the focus is to, on the youth of our community. So it's a natural to play a role within the school systems. And we want to continue to play a role as we drive towards what we believe is an opportunity. We're so passionate about STEM and trades and the technical opportunities there because in manufacturing, there's already a talent shortage. And everything that I read is going to get worse. As more and more people age and retire, there's a huge vacuum that's got to be filled by someone and we hope to fill it with some of our youth. As we all know, not everyone's meant to go to college. That's sort of been the push for the last decades, but really we need to change that focus because there's opportunities in manufacturing companies like Team One right here in South Central Michigan. We'll hire them, we'll let them work, we'll educate them in whatever trades or technical areas they need, and we'll pay for everything. So they earn a wage, they can get a trade, and with that trade, they can make great wages, 30, 60,000 or more, and no debt. So we're passionate about trying to send that message, and we'll continue to talk about it. And finally, I do want to say thank you to the school board. I sat in your chair one day, and it's been a few years ago, but I do know the commitment it takes, the time, not just here at the meetings, but outside the meetings. And I personally, our family, and Team One Pl Plastics, thank you for your service. Marshall School District's in good hands, and you're moving forward. And thank you again for this award. I just have to mention, uh, Bill and I happened to meet today with Fred Jacobs, who's, who's the publisher of John Tendler's Boss, and Fred launched into a whole explanation, or a whole statement of why we need to do this that was very compelling, and it was really neat to be able to tell him that we're already doing these things with partners like Team One Plastics and Craig Carroll, so I feel like we're ahead of the curve on this, and we need to 
keep going in this direction. So yeah, there's actually a, a new initiative. Um, what we've learned through our STEP program a lot, and I haven't met with our partners yet to describe this in a meeting, but we're finding that our juniors and seniors aren't quite ready to make that full commitment to step in. So they need that extra time. And what I'm working with right now with uh, Mark O'Connell and KCC is to offer an a, a training program, certification training program for their 13th year to get them engaged in the um, uh, manufacturing industrial side of things. And we want to tap into Craig and our other partners and step to be able to help shape what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're real excited about it. They did a uh, test drive of it up in uh, Hastings over the summer. Um, it was wildly uh, That's where Fred's from. So maybe, That's yeah, right. Yeah. So this is coming to an area near us, That's which cool. will hopefully be driven by Marshall and, and the KCC initiative along with our partnership with STEP. Awesome. Awesome. We're real excited about that. It's very cool. Yeah, it is cool. First week of school. We had no floods. <laughs> no floods. Kindergarten classrooms were whole at Harrington. <laughs> We welcomed uh, our uh, 200 plus students that came into Harrington with 100 men in, uh, in ties that kind of frightened some of our little binkies, but uh, in the cool. end, they understood with some assurances that it was a good thing. Uh, we had a lot of uh, community members out. We had Albion College represented in strong force, and it was just an exciting day, and uh, everything seems to be clicking. Got through the first week without any major snafus across the entire district, which is always good to say. And, um, you know, right now we're just tweaking it. And we spent the first week, and we will be spending this week, uh, developing a relationship, connection, and engagement with our students in every single classroom. Um, at the uh, Welcome Back Breakfast, I told everyone, my administrators and staff alike, take the next week or two weeks to develop relationship, develop climate and culture. Practice and practice and practice routines. What are our rules of engagement are in the classroom, how we treat each other, how we support each other, understand transitions, all of that, no matter what building you're in. Um, and it's worked out really well so far. And so I'm looking forward to some really strong uh, focus on learning, which will be coming up. Because it doesn't happen unless our kids like who's in front of them as a teacher. And like the uh, um, YouTube on TED Talk, Kids don't learn from people they don't like. Mm -hmm. you know, so you gotta make sure you make that engagement. So um, really excited about that. I think we're gonna have some really great things going on. Any questions? Enrollment conti continues to unfold. Uh, school of Choice ended last Friday. Signed my last two letters, I think, that got under the wire on, on Friday the 18th uh, for School of Choice, two families. Uh, there's a couple other other adjustments being made between superintendents. Sometimes I release a student based on good cause. Sometimes they release students based on good cause. And so as that kind of materializes, we'll be able to start bringing out the more formal now, um, uh, numbers as we get through September and into the fourth Wednesday count, which is when? October 4th? October 4th. And um, unless you didn't know, Kimberly took over the uh, pupil counting role <laughs> and, the, and the auditing role. And boy, is she busy. I, I see it all the time. And, but she does a great job, and she learned a lot last year. And we're really excited about having her at the helm on, on stu um, student enrollment. OK. That's it for a report from the superintendent. Thank you. We're going to move to board topics. We're actually going to do a C first of the draft of the fiscal year 2016-17 audit report. Are you, uh, is it Raymond or Reman? Raymond. Uh, Raymond Robson. Thank you. And this is Nate Balderman. And I wanted to say that it's not in draft form. This is the final audit. Oh, is this final? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Well, Thank you for your time, um, and thank you for moving me up on the agenda. This is number two of three for me tonight, so <laughs> still have to uh, run over to uh, one of the a nearby districts. So um, tonight, I'm just going to go uh, kind of quickly through the report, highlight a few items. Uh, feel free to interrupt uh, to ask any questions. Um, so. Uh, 
like Becky said, this is in final form, actually issued today. Um, so uh, very happy to be able to bring those uh, to you today. Um, you know, with all of the changes this year, and there were some special accounting that had to happen that, that uh, I'll, I'll highlight in this report, it was good to get it out uh, at this time. So um, the financial statements, if you jump to page 14, um, and page 15, these are the uh, government-wide financial statements. Uh, I just highlight these because they are your, uh, they are a required statement. There is some information here that can be alarming when you first look at it, um, but just want to explain it. Um, you know, if you've uh, looked at, if as we've talked about in in past years, this uh, the total net position is a deficit. Um, like every single school district in the state of Michigan because of the net pension liability uh, that's reported. Um, so that amount causes uh, you, you to be in deficit on the government-wide basis. Um, but again, um, that's not a deficit that you can pay off. It's not, you know, that, that liability is a, a liability that's just your share of the liability of the uh, statewide pension system. Uh, it will only actually get worse um, coming next year. We actually have a subsequent event disclosure that talks about uh, ORS and MIPSERS decided to, um, which is pretty common now to reduce the uh, rate of return that they're using in their actuarial reports. When that happens, that means the liability goes up. Um, and in the, in the same way, uh, as you've had this pension liability recorded, there's new standards that come into effect next year for retiree health care in that plan. So your share of that will also go into the liability and increase that. So that's a change that's coming next year. Um, if you look at um, page 15, you can see um, this is your statement of activities or your income statement. Um, there are some unique issues this year um, that came with the reporting and with the uh, annexation of Albion schools. Uh, there, the accounting treatment for that is a, the reporting of what's called a special item. Um, basically what happens when you have a combination of districts, uh, the way this happened is it basically takes their book value, their carrying value of um, their deficit from the prior year and it pulls it in and reports it, and you report it as a part of, um, as your school, as a, as a part of Marshall Schools. Um, if you go to page uh, 16, uh, this is your governmental funds balance sheet. Um, you'll see here uh, you have separate columns for the general fund and the sinking fund, which are considered to be uh, major funds based on, it's just you know a, a simple calculation that has to go through and there's requirements that meet that. And then all your other funds are combined and there's a combining schedule in the back that reports um, your food service fund, all your debt service funds, um, and the remaining amount that's still left in that 2010B capital projects fund. Um, you'll see there your total fund balance for the general fund at the end of the year was just under 3.4 million. Um, and there is a classification there where you had 258,000 of prepaids that's considered to be non-spendable because the concept is you've already spent the money so it's not available to spend. So your unassigned fund balance is 3.1 million at the end of the year. Um, and that's approximately 11% of your um, of your total expenditures, excluding that that special item. Um, on page 18 is your income statement um, for the general fund, the sinking fund, and then your non-majors in total. Actually, for the general fund, I like to look at pages 20 and 21. That's a kind of the best place to look at the results for the general fund. Um, because this is your budget to actual statement, it shows you what your original budget was coming into the year. Um, anything adopted prior to June thirtieth of two thousand or July first of two thousand sixteen. The the second column is your final budget, includes all budget amendments up through the end of uh, June of this year, and then your actual results. So um, the original budget uh, anticipated a loss of three hundred and forty one thousand. Um, your final budget with all those amendments in it, uh, you had an increase of 729000 and then your actual results were um, 
uh, almost 1.6 million increase in fund balance. Um, you can see that, and that's the on the bottom towards the bottom of page 21. If you go up a line, you'll see that special item transfer of operations. That's the deficit that that you had coming in from Albion Schools um, during the year, and of course there was grant monies and everything that uh, helped uh, pay off that deficit um, uh, during the year. Um, that's just stuff included in state source sources of revenues. Um, the next uh, area that I'd that I'd highlight is uh, in the footnotes to the financial statements. Um, you'll see throughout the statements, uh, just as an example, on page 33, you have your capital assets footnote. And I just point this out so you can kind of see how this uh, transfer of operations or the annexation worked into the financial statements. You can see um, the beginning balance uh, came in on bottom of, or on page 33, you have the beginning balance. So that was Marshall as stated last year. And then the next column is the transfer of operations. This was what was brought in from Albion Schools. Um, these were audited figures from last year. There were no adjustments that had to be made from the audited figures. Um, so that brought in those balances and now they're a part of your records and they'll be shown that way going forward um, as if it's, you know, it is one district as it is. So it's just this first year, those disclosure, additional disclosures have to be made. Uh, the only other uh, item that I wanted to to point out in the in the footnotes, page forty four, uh, really summarizes everything in the in the in the balances that came in. There's a special item footnote that talks about uh, very briefly, but that that um, transfer of operations. The next part of the report that I would go to point you to is a very nice summary of the results. Really, the results of our piece. Of things, you know, these financial statements are your financial statements uh, prepared by management with our assistance. But ultimately, the responsibility for the financial statements rests with management. Um, so, and if you go to page seventy-three, this is a good summary of, of the results of, of what we're here for, which is to audit those financial statements. Um, first of all, to uh, give you. Uh, to show that you can rely on the information that's there. Um, uh, I, the opinion that we give is that the financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects. So we're not testing every transaction. Um, but as a part of that, we give an, an opinion. Um, and what you're looking for is an unmodified opinion. That's the very top line uh, type of audit report issued is unmodified. Uh, that's considered to be a clean opinion. Um, when we're doing the financial statement audit, we do look at internal controls. We're not doing it in order to give you an opinion on those controls, but we're doing it uh, as part of our planning process so we can give you that opinion. Uh, if things co raise, come to our attention during that process that are significant or material, we're required to report those. And I'm happy to say there were no findings uh, related to the financial statements. Um, similarly, the other big part of our audit is because you spend more than 750000 of funds that originate from federal sources. Um, we're required to do what's called a single audit. Uh, this year, um, we tested the child nutrition cluster, the, the food service um, fund basically is what we tested this year. Uh, through that, we're required to look at compliance and also internal controls over compliance for, uh, for that program that we test. Uh, this year, we did have one item um, that's included in the report uh, that's detailed on page 74. Um, but that, that item is you know, relatively small. It's considered a significant deficiency because of the sampling that we use. Um, but the overall dollar amounts that we're talking about with, with the issue that, that's reported there um, was fairly minor. Uh, corrective action is included there um, on that. And I would expect it's something that, you know, with the the additional controls that, that are going to be put in place, I think it shouldn't be an issue in the in the future. So um, that's all I really had on the financial statements. Um, so I guess if anyone has any other questions, I'd be happy to, to answer. Could you put the, um, the finding that you had with the food service 
more in dollars and cents. What what was the payroll? Um, I mean, we're talking like the I think the difference in the pay rate was like ten cents. <laughs> so ten cents an hour. Um, to the good or to the bad of the employee? To the good, to of, the the good of the employee. Okay. Yeah. So it was a manual process of entering into the system, and there was just you know an error that was caused there. That thing that. Yeah. That's the right call. When I anytime, anytime there's a man, it, it's one of those where the computer's systems work, but anytime you have to enter something into a computer, there's room for error. Yeah. So it looks like you're just adding a control in place there. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me again what was that fund balance? I think you said it was 3.394. Yeah. About. Yeah, that's on page 16. Thank you. Any other questions, Tom? This is like we've had issues with that child nutrition cluster before, but there have been different ones. I mean, this is just no no recurring issues with things. In the, and this now we, I remember we maybe finding ten years last ago. Year, what was the finding last year? Last year's finding was a significant audit adjustment, so it was a financial statement finding. It wasn't oh, for yeah. federal awards. Did we, did we correct that? Yes. Yes, that was corrected. That's on page seventy-five. Thank you. It talks about the prior year finding. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's another issue. I'm sorry, I've said enough of these things like five years ago. <laughs> so what, what I'm pleased is the internal audit controls and those kind of things are in good, strong condition. And yeah. considering the incredible complexity of this whole budget year relative to yeah. leading into annexation, after annexation, the um, absorption of, of assets and liabilities from the Albion uh, community schools, this is just really a stellar report. Yeah, good job. Kudos to you guys. Yes. Yeah. My team, too. We had good people that worked in those four rounds. So, 11%. Pardon? 11.1. Was that the fund balance? 11%. Okay. 11%. 11%. The unassigned fund balance. Just don't get all giddy because you remember we were like 1.7. One point eight over I was budget. I just want to hear it. I suggested a couple times that 10% would be really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember when we were striving to be in the positive. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any so other don't, questions? Don't, don't call Becky repeatedly about being on the board when she's working on this because she's not called back. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, you not another board. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, I got some for you. <laughs> okay, we'll go to 2017 M step. Sounds good. <clears throat> we have a PowerPoint. Um, this is everything you need to know about the 2017 administration of M step. Brought to you by our illustrious Don Beck from Youth and Players. Oh, oh. Don did a really great job, uh, worked along with IDEX as well, uh, which is something that, that um, Becky and I locked into two years ago. And you'll see everything you need, but I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this report now. So I want you, I want you to put that down and know that that's, that's your reference, and you can look at it all you need to. Um, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you have any questions, um, give Don a call. <laughs> No, give me a call, it'll be fine. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the outcomes, but most importantly, we really need to get serious deep dive into GAP. And I wanna talk about GAP. Because um, in my view, this, is, this assessment for 2017 was our baseline, okay? So the baseline is after the um, cooperative agreement with the middle school, which happened mid-year, and it was right in the middle of the announcement of annexation uh, consideration for the, for the electorate over there in Albion. And then with last year in Harrington, the startup of, or restart of the, of the elementary school in Harrington, and the issues we had in that restart, and it wasn't stellar, um, but we've landed in a good place and we're moving it forward. So this is our baseline to begin with. 
And as we talk about how we move it forward, I'm gonna come back to you during the year with Don's assistance and we're gonna be reporting to you how the gap is shaping up from internal assessments that we do and then what the gap is gonna show us when we get down to the 2018 MSTEP assessment. Rule of thumb is, well, the, the stretch goal is you wanna close the gap of any um, disaggregated groups from the, from the whole to within 10%. When we talk about gap in the MSTEP, we're talking about gap, the difference between those that are proficient or advanced in a particular content area versus those that aren't. And you do a comparison of who the proficiency between what, whichever disaggregated group you look at. Historically, I've always reported to you the gap between our economically disadvantaged and those that are not economically disadvantaged. Well, now we have an end size, a number of students that actually can now be reported without fear of um, uh, FERPA violation where we can talk about racially diverse students relative to white students or white counterparts. And I also always like to look at gender. So I wanna see if the pattern of gender with reading and math are changing, okay? So with that, I'm gonna share a few things. This is our K-8 M-STEP proficiency. All, uh, this is all um, uh, the blue, I'm sorry, I'm a little colorblind, but the blue is um, ELA, the green is math, the yellow is science, and can we, can we turn off the light so we can see all of it better? Um, thank you. Uh, and the red is social studies. I wanna remind you that in 2015, uh, was just before we made all of these changes. And along with the changes that happened in 2016, which was when the middle school came over for the cooperative agreement mid-year, we also went to electronic testing for the first time. Okay? And then when we get to 2017, it's after the annexation, one year after the annexation, or less than one year, and we're still doing electronic testing, including for the first time, Harrington students were electronically tested than they've done, be done before they were doing uh, paper and pencil in the Omni Community Schools up to that point. I say that because I've told you guys this before, that when you change the style and method of administering a particular assessment, when it goes from paper and pencil to electronic, if the students aren't well prepared on that, because you're manipulating the mouse now, um, if you read a passage for reading and you're asked from, the, um, from that reading, segment a comprehensive uh, co a question about comprehension. You have to scroll down and be able to know that this little thing down here scrolls you down and you can find that passage. And then you have to go back up and show evidence. If you're not really well equipped with that at the third grade level, you're gonna miss the boat or fourth or fifth grade level. Maybe you should use a touch screen instead of the mouse. Yeah, we don't do, <laughs> yeah, touch, touch screens aren't yeah. compatible for this yet. MSTEP proficiency compared with the CISD and state. Uh, these are all subject areas combined in our three grades three through eight. Uh, we're the blue line. The yellow line is all LEAs and PSAs are basically the state mean. And the green line are all our um, uh, peer counter counterparts that are in the um, CISD uh, network. And as you can see, the, the declining um, slope is not what we want to be dealing with. But at the same time, we were way above uh, in 2014 doing paper and pencil when other, other schools were migrating to, to electronic. Mm -hmm. Then in 2015, we started migrating to electronic. In 16, we started going down again with uh, the changes that we had with all the, the dynamics with our district. And now we're at baseline in my view at 2017. Now this individually, when you start looking at this report and you break it down, what is our reading level for third grade? Our reading level for third grade may, may look a little low, but if you look at all each individual building, you'll find that some of our buildings are doing very, very well. Okay, so it's our job to make sure that we're lifting that up and we have a lot of concentrated effort to put in front of us. And notice on the right side here, um, 
We're below Athens and below Olivet in overall averages for the MSTEP results for grades three through eight. Athens has a really small population. Olivet has a smaller population than us. So being in the top three, I'm okay with that, especially considering all the stuff we've gone through in, in the, um, the distractions and the focus and the dynamics of trying to run this. But again, this is baseline. So we're not gonna have this conversation next year. It's gonna be how do we move the needle and how do we start moving it back up and how are our kids being, um, uh, have learned how to be administered electronically and then how are we gonna represent accurately how our kids are achieving. This is 11th and 12th grade MSTEP proficiency on um, science and social studies uh, because ELA and math is, is captured within the um, SAT scores. So in 2016, uh, for um, science, we had a, a small, well, a decrease, a, a negative slope, um, just a bit, but in social studies, we continue to climb. This is our 11th and 12th grade MSTEP proficiency compared with the ISD and state. The blue one is us, the yellow one is our all the state averages, and we're just slightly above the state average. And then the green line is the slope relative to our, our counterparts in the Calvin County region. And usually when I look at these things and say notice the end size is because the scales are smaller. So 40.4% versus 32, 33, 34%, actually 32% for our overall Calvin County counterparts. So we're about eight percentage points above, eight or nine. This is the SAT composite for our um, 2017 SAT. And while that number looks slightly, I mean, it's a positive, but very po slight <coughs> positive slope. This is the aggregate between our high school and our opportunity high school combined. And we increased our SAT score composite, which is all the scores together, um, by um, 10 points. If you look at um, this one, this shows us relative to what happened with all the state. The state had a very slight positive improvement, and the county, our peers, went down. Don, did you add that other slide? I did. I don't know why it didn't go up. Okay. So I want to go back to this one for a second. If you broke out, remember I told you that the state likes to com combine our opportunity high school and our traditional high school, non-traditional and traditional, with graduation rates. Mm -hmm. So the last year we had a graduation rate for our traditional high school of 96%, and our non-traditional high school of 71%. And when you combine those two, we had an overall graduation rate of 82% for high school completions. You can see that, it, and I've been arguing this at the state level, and Brian Wisson promises me this year they're not gonna do it, right? They haven't done it this year, because this is the year we're assessing, but they did the same thing with the SAT scores. So if you look at, right now, if you look at the, where are the, do you have a red pointer? Yeah, I do, right? If you look at this slope, and this number right here, the state's average for SAT for this year is um, 1,008. This is 1,008, okay? The uh, count, our peer counterparts in the county is 970. Actually, it's less than that. No, I, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. No, that's right, 970. If you go up here, our aggregate is 1,026.9. If you just pull out the Marshall High School, they are all the way up here at 1,059. They're all the way up here. So, so what percentage of the people go to alternative high school if they came from the Marshall Middle School? Like what, what percentage of them represent the population that might be at Marshall High School who didn't have the opportunity to Because, well, if you're taking them out and 
you're taking kids who maybe not do well in a traditional environment and taking them out and saying they don't count in our overall score with other schools that don't have an opportunity school do have those kids in there and that affects the overall amount but we're also getting kids that are coming from Homer or Concord and other places right. so if you take all of them and merge them in that doesn't give a, a very accurate representation either. Yeah and it used to be um, Carrie that the outcome data was was given back to the sending district when the kids came into a shared educational entity and now that's not the case. We just own the kids that come in, they're, they're part of our system. Um, the reason why I separate between traditional and non-traditional, when they're non-traditional, we have kids that are, you know, oops, sorry, are blowing the socks off of um, 1,059 composites. And we have kids in our high school doing the same thing. The problem, the, the issue with it is, is they truly are apples to oranges because in the non-traditional school, they actually um, they have shorter periods of time for their um, coursework, uh, as far as um, the number of weeks in their coursework. They can actually earn an extra credit in their coursework at the uh, Opportunity High School. Um, we have a lot of issues with kids with the, all kinds of dynamics that they're bringing in with them from the family and communities, et cetera, that they're dealing with. Um, the traditional students are more on the traditional track. So if you look at comparisons of other high schools, other high schools, every county has, most every county has an alternative program, whether it's done by a particular district or it's done by a, by a county at large. Like right now in Battle Creek, there's a Battle Creek alternative that they have within their Battle Creek system. They have the Battle Creek Community High School, which is supposed to be a broader high school available to all kids in the region. Um, so. If we were going to do some comparisons, the best thing to do is do comparisons of non-traditional schools to non-traditional schools, and high schools to high schools, or traditional high schools to traditional high schools. I think that would be the fairest way to do it. And, and I do want it, the state seems to agree, they just haven't caught up to it in pulling that out yet. But at the end of the year, they will be. Are they ultimately our kids? Absolutely. There's a, there's a reason why they're non-traditional learners for all kinds of reasons. Some of them are just, they don't want to be at a, high, a traditional high school setting, and they don't value that. Um, and they like what the learning environment is that they're receiving right now. So we have some really good, and, and I gotta tell you, our last uh, graduation rates or completion rates for the Opportunity High School was right around that 80%, which is really outstanding for any uh, non-traditional high school setting. So all I'm saying is, if you're going to compare, compare traditional to traditional and non-traditional to non-traditional, and you get a better view of really how we're doing what relative to our peers. Okay. Um, so here's the ELA. Uh, ELA is really reading and writing. We don't assess writing individually anymore like we used to at the meet. So basically, it's captured within the, um, the reading or the ELA concept of testing. Um, this is economically disadvantaged next to their um, counterparts. The blue is economically disadvantaged. So I guess interpret this as the number of kids that are economically disadvantaged that still are proficient or advanced was 35. We had 35% of the kids in the, of the economically disadvantaged pool that were proficient or advanced versus 59 of their peers that are not economically disadvantaged. So there's the gap. And then you look in the fourth grade, the gap is bigger. And you look in the fifth grade, the gap is even larger. And you go to the sixth grade, the gap is the largest in reading proficiency. And then it starts to close a little bit. Okay? So when we talk about gap, that's a thumbnail sketch of how we how I want to start representing that to you and seeing that these two bars start closing more and more when we get closer to each other. And that doesn't mean decrease 
it means elevate all and at the same time elevating our economically disadvantaged students. And to do that, you have to have really strong partnership between the schools, their parents and their homes and their guardians and the community. Because it takes more than just in front of our teacher. Now we have some really cool things going on with reading that, it, that we'll roll out pretty soon about the Reading Now Network and some of the fidelity that we're working with in regards to our kindergarten, first, second, and even third graders um, to be able to start closing a lot of this gap. And once we get the foundation at this grade level, and you know the new law requires us to do a whole lot of different things because kids want proficient in reading by the time they end their, end their third grade year. So that's gap for economically disadvantaged. Here's economically disadvantaged for math. Again, there's the gap. Smaller in, in fourth grade. Goes back a little uh, larger in fifth grade. Pretty large in sixth grade, largest in seventh right now. And then starts closing a little bit more by eighth. The LA achievement gap for racial diversity, for the students that are racially diverse, and that could be Hispanic, um, African American, uh, Asian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the gap is here for um, ELA for reading in third, and third. The gap is a little bit larger in fourth, larger in fifth, much larger in sixth starting to close a little bit and starting to close a little bit by the time we get to eighth grade. So this is the pattern for the racially diverse. And this is the pattern for um, their white counterparts. For math achievement, for racially diverse, kind of about the same, a little larger, in significant way, we didn't have any racially diverse students that were proficient or advanced in mathematics by sixth grade. Seventh grade, even larger, although we did start elevating some, some percentage of kids, and then smaller by eighth grade. So this, this section here is pretty consistent when we talk about math and ELA. And math is a challenge for us, and we're gonna figure that out. But if you look at the racially diverse population, that's a trend. Yep. Randy, why would you say um, sixth grade? I mean, whether we are talking about um, economically disadvantaged, um, racial difference, or um, even I'm looking at the boys to girls on the A head here. Too. Like, so, oh, sorry. Um, sixth grade, like that seems to be that. Well, Dave, low in Dave could actually category. Dave could actually speak to that a little bit, but traditionally, sixth grade is a real cut year. Um, it's a major transition from elementary into middle school. Mm -hmm. It's developmentally a shift for our children as well. Um, the standards have changed, and you know, each one of these years that I talked about, the standards are elevated. They become more complex and more rigorous, and so forth. And so, as kids grow up. If they can maintain themselves at a flat line like, whoops, let me go away, at a flat line like this, if they can maintain themselves, they're actually doing really, really well because not only are they keeping themselves at proficiency, but they're also taking on harder and harder, harder standards. And by the time you get to the sixth grade, there's a major shift in mathematics in particular. Wouldn't you agree, David? Yeah, but you are algebraic, an abstract thinking and throw a little variable in there and a letter and a letter and what you're talking about. Um, just candidly, really had a hard conversation with a math teacher last year. He had gone through, since I've been here, this is my 13th year, I think, four different math series. And we always we shift to different math series because we want to score and take on that traditionally in math series. And every year, since I've been here, grade six, seven, eight, there's always been a downshift in how we perform. Normally, we are always above the state average, but still the trend is always, it dips as you move to six, seven, eight, it, it starts picking back up at eight. So having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the teachers, it, it is not about the series, 
It is about what we're doing with our students. And we really have to change how we are teaching, the structure of the environment of classrooms, uh, more hands-on work with individual students. So instead of the traditional model of math, which is I give direct instruction or we do a warm up, whatever it might be, and, and this is kind of been the norm, five to 10 minutes on that warm up, then we review homework, and then we do direct instruction, the students practice, then more direct instruction. We, those days have gotta go because we're getting these results every single year. And fortunately, the staff is really taking that to heart and are looking at different models such as stations. I don't know if you're familiar with writing workshops where you'll have groups of students in different stations throughout the room working on different things. And they always come up to a teacher's desk. The teacher, um, Randy and Becky were kind enough to allow us to use a Exact app, which is a uh, software that will help us support what, our, what we're doing with students, help us identify specific deficiencies with students, and then give them guided practice in those areas that they can do not only in the classroom, but they can do it at home um, as well. So our teachers are doing things differently. One interesting fact that you need to know about our, our meet data or MSTAP data, excuse me, 10 points. If we were to have every student move just 10 points where they were, we would have 70% at every grade level need a proficient. 70%, 10 points. So one of our school improvement goals in math is just that. Um, we're saying that they have to increase by 110 points, and that will, improve what they're doing so yeah this is such a gross overstatement um, each of the principals unpacks all this data individually and with their classes and their teachers and they start taking a look at what can we do differently one of the things I mean just like an over here's another over generalization but in fifth grade fourth grade and fifth grade if our kids don't learn their multiplication and division subtraction and addition they don't understand proportionality by the time they get to sixth grade, they're hit with that. And if they don't have it down pat, they're gonna really struggle even through pre-algebra or algebra. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those milestone learning um, uh, pieces that they have to get, I would say by mastery, not by proficiency in the fifth grade. And so we have to go back and take a look at those things and make sure that we're focused on the, on the, on the right thing to move the needle. And if I can add, yeah. There's another factor that goes in, especially in grade six, seven, eight, that, that we are trying to deal with is lack of motivation. We've had many students that don't care about this test, parents don't care about it, and they just say, for you know, for some of them, look, we're not gonna exempt you, but don't worry about it. Kids will complete a test in five to ten minutes. And we know that, that is a that adds to some of the uh, the difficulty in how students are reporting because there's a complete disconnect and how students are performing on their teacher graded assessments, which the families value, and how they're performing on this. And when you comparatively look at our SAT scores, which people value, that's your ticket or ticket to scholarships for the school you want to go. Right. There isn't any value in the M step, which is a whole other piece, but that's we are trying to combat that and find a way to make that valuable for our students. Right, so when he's talking about those assessments, we can use those assessments to give a better real-time kind of analysis of where we're at with GAP. And we start taking a look at how they're, how they're achieving. And that's gonna have more meaning for us throughout the year than these kind of end, end of the year things until these assessments through MSTEP carries a lot more weight. Uh, here's gender, interesting enough. Uh, male is in the blue, female is in the red. This is for mathematics, or this is for ELA. This is the stereotypical experience that we have is that females are stronger readers and better writers. And then when you get over to this one, males are better mathematicians. That's not true. It's a stereotype. And somehow we tend to bear it out with the data 
But the reality is, those are messages our kids give themselves when they get into these things. Girls may say, I'm never good at math, so therefore they're not going to be good at math. Guys say, I don't like to read, or I, I don't write very well, so therefore I'm never going to be good in literature. And so we have to constantly combat those, those stereotypes. It's really interesting. I'd love to see this change, but that's the way it, it seems to be each time we look at it. Any questions? So this will be our dialogue mostly when we start talking about assessment. Um, Don and I are going to work with the principals about what kind of internal assessments can we continually paint this picture to see if it's changing and if it truly is different than what we see in the year end. Um, so you'll have that in front of you as we, as we go through the year. And um, ultimately, we want to see these things change. But again, I'm considering this baseline. We're starting, it's kind of like when I play golf and I, and I have like four double bogeys in a row. I put this big line on my scorecard right after the last double bogey. And I say, that's my baseline. This is where I start and I move forward. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. So we want you to understand this data before um, a lot of questions get raised. So question we talked about at this the uh, CCD planning about changing your evaluation for the next year. Do, do pieces of this, can pieces of this make this make their way into your evaluation? I mean, obviously, I don't think we want to say the goal of ten percent gap within the year, but to make no, that's a stretch goal. But I, I know, and I'm being facetious. But want, I, is, there, is, some, there, yeah. is there a piece of it that we can work into it somehow? Mm -hmm. Because I. I seems pretty compelling that there might be a way to do that. Well, you'll notice that, um, and we haven't brought it back to you, we're not planning on doing that until next time or into October, but there are some benchmarks we want to put on there. When we talk about, like, for example, reading, mm -hmm. which is, you know, everybody can be proficient. Uh, actually, it's got to be at least 80% proficient <coughs> in reading or ELA by the third year. That becomes a benchmark. That's what I'm holding myself accountable to. That's what I'm holding our education to. And all, the all the way up to. Yeah. Okay. But what does that look like? And Bill said, capture it in four different major goals, and then you can, you know, put in some other objectives underneath, like the Reading Now Network, and what are we going to be doing differently about kindergarten through second grade? And it's all around our sponsorship for now and the assessments that we do with that, and the um, progress monitoring we do with that. So. You'll see some targets within that okay. to make sure that we're starting to move. You'll see little bites, and as those little bites get accomplished, you're going to start seeing the overall objective change. Cool. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. You know, we have Battle of the Books, and I think you're talking about gender and about stereotypes or labels put on boys for math and girls for reading. And I think, you know, like Battle of the Books is one of those programs that people get teams together and sometimes they're mixed, sometimes they're all boy or all girl teams and and I think what a great thing to like take that stereotype away and like I think oh, I wish we had something for math too. You know, some yes. kind of like, you know, math goal or quiz, you know, to get them excited about they get so excited about Battle of the Books and get they prep for it for weeks and weeks. Yeah, they do. So they didn't have something for math as well that would like, you know, get them excited for that with some kind of end result, you know. Yep, all those things really are helpful. Okay. All right. Last thing on the board topic is this. These are not yours. Did I say that already? You did. I just wanted you to see, this is the flip chart that each instructor gets. And if you notice how it's laid out, it's our emergency management guide. We have emergency numbers, Marshall Public Schools numbers, evacuation procedures. Then we have topics, fire and arson, armed student uh, or hostage within the building, medical emergencies, accidents, death on school property, bomb threat, um, device located. The bomb threat and device located has changed in the philosophies and the approach in which we take. Now, I'm not going to talk about these publicly because a lot of this is just internal, and we don't want to put this out publicly as far as the details behind it. That's why I'm not going through detail. But you'll see, again, the shelter in place, severe warning, uh, weather, intruder, trespasser, suicide, exterior lockdown procedures, interior lockdowns, all those kind of things. Each 
Each um, teacher has one per classroom, and if they teach in multiple classrooms, they'll have multiple copies, okay? Um, each office has one, and they have a couple extras for substitutes to get familiar with and at least take with them, or we're gonna expect that the teacher leaves one for their substitute to come to the classroom. Each kitchen has one that's hung up in the kitchen across the district. So when they hear those announcements, um, they can immediately go to what this looks like and they can quickly reference and be ready to at least support or know what they're doing, all right? On top of this book is this book, the Emergency Response Guide. This is the deep dive. So this is the deep dive that all my administrators will have in their hot hands come Thursday. Um, it just came, it just arrived. And it also will be in every um, uh, building secretary's office. So that the building secretary, who is gonna be one of the key coordinators with the administrator, knows and understands the detail behind these things. Each of our first responders will have this book. So they know exactly that we're all on the same page and it's already been vetted with uh, Compliance Inc, Compliance One Inc. Um, uh, as well as uh, with our local police department. I gotta say that um, uh, McDonald was very, really, really helpful in helping put this together over the last two years, getting the content straight, and we were able to bring it, to, bring it home to bear with the help of Compliance One. Um, so they're gonna have it, they'll be on the same page. This will be all the ins and outs of it, it's not for public consumption because we have to be in control of safety responses, okay? Um, along with this, our first responders, our dispatch, will actually have access to our, um, uh, our uh, video camera in case of emergency. They're only to access that when an emergency exists. And they can actually plug in and look on the monitor in the hallways to see if there's an intruder, let's say if there's an intruder in the building. They'll be able to look at that and monitor that and help inform the police as the police arrive for their first response, okay? Are we still the only school in town that has it? I believe we are. And then the other thing is, um, this interesting little box over here on the wall, in case you haven't noticed this, each of the um, classrooms, the office areas, et cetera, has this box. We still have open session, just a second. And you open it, and you take this out in case of emergency, and it slides down. And this can't be opened. And the purpose is, well, they can come to the dog, blah, 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 so they say they can't. That's true. The whole idea of this is not absolute, but it empowers every teacher about what they're going to do instead of just turning off the light and going to the corner and keeping their kids safe away from windows, which they're going to still do. It gives them empowerment because they can, they can blockade their door. They can think about what they're going to do next. Every teacher has been told in their training that they should think through mentally what is their response. If somebody does, see my glass door is just like this, right? So if somebody does break through to it and they stick something in, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna let them continue to just stick something in and come in the building or come in the room or am I gonna do something um, aggressive or offensive to try to protect those people that are in this room. And so we have to think through that on a personal level. And the other level is, um, if we can slow down an intruder for just a minute or a minute and a half, most likely they're gonna go to the path of least resistance. And if they find that this is blockaded, they're gonna go to the next one that's blockaded and then the next one. By the time we've done enough of that reaction, first responders have the opportunity to get here and take control of the situation. So this isn't an end all, but it's really a great asset. And if you talk to any of the teachers in our buildings or any of the staff members, they're, they're ecstatic about having this little piece in their classroom to give them a little empowerment over what they intend to do. So, so how does it work here? Damaging the door? It slides down this slot and it goes right into the floor, which is an inset. Okay. 
So this is still evolving. We're going to still get better at this. Our staff are going to get more familiar with it. We're going to have some mock drills done by um, Compliance One. I won't know. They're going to call me up and say, Doc, you have an intruder at such and such building. They're going to call over and say, go up to one teacher and say, you have an intruder um, down the hallway. What do you do? And we're going to go through the whole mock drill including taking our kids out to our muster areas and then find out whether or not we did it well. So um, really, really pleased to have these guys supporting us in what we're trying to accomplish here. Awesome. Any questions? I will say that when you have visitors in the building, like take extra look at care or caution, because I know some of the buildings that I go into, like, and I go in there to teach and then nobody tells me. And I remember the first time I was in a building and things were going on, like I had never been through any training or, you know, didn't know what was happening. So they just kind of like let your administrators know, like watch those visitors in the building and mm -hmm. like, you know, make sure that they know who's there. And yeah. If you want to keep saying, well, <clears throat> one of the things that we've struggled with the hospital with is when we create one, we can get updated when everything's changed. Mm -hmm. So it's always a that's always the biggest obstacle. To change the process or things like that. How to make sure you cover every book. It is, and some things get updated. Like like uh, <laughs> um, Joe Humphreys and, and Steve um, went back to. A, they found a really old crisis manual for Marshall Public Schools. I think it was like in the '80s, and they started the meeting off with all our staff about what you were supposed to do if you encountered an armed student in the building. And it was, ask them to give you the gun. <laughs> Hand me the gun to you. We, we, do, we do different things now about that kind of stuff. And, and um, you know, the um, different protocols have, have evolved over time based on what we've learned, sadly enough, from tragedies that occurred across the United States and around the world. So um, I'm really pleased with these guys. They do a really good cutting edge kind of approach. Um, and uh, I'm confident that we're, get, we're better off for that, Absolutely. better prepared. Absolutely. So I'll be collecting these out. Did I say you're not to take them? Yeah, we'll be careful. Right, I'll be collecting them. Does anybody have any questions? This is really interesting. Other than everybody knows that Tammy's taking them all. Yeah, we do. You can keep your eye on it. You mentioned that all the administrators have these. Do the, all the teachers have? All the teachers have the flip. They all have one of these. Okay. All the administrators have one of these. All the sec uh, Every main secretary in each of the buildings has one, the office secretary. And then um, counselors will have this. They may even have one of these. Um, and then first responders get these, as well as central office. Right. These were Yeah, these were issued. At the breakfast, welcome back breakfast. Welcome. Okay. Did our Elgin schools have the Elgin intruders too? Which is it? They wanted. They said call nine one one instead of a direct link. But over here in this manual, Terry, Albion Police is identified with their non emergency number. Okay. Anybody else? Good. Okay. We'll move on to consent consent agenda personnel. Randy read off, got very tired reading them all off. Uh, can I have a motion? Move. Support. Okay. Any discussion? Start with her. Yes. 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 Okay, now we'll move to action item audit reports. Accept the fiscal year 2016 17 audit report as prepared and presented by Rena Nelson. 
quick background. After the business office closed the books for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2017, Raymond Robson came to the district in July to audit the financial statements. The audit report was thoroughly reviewed by the business office prior to being presented to the board. The report is now being presented to the board in the final form. It's my recommendation that you approve such. I have a motion? Move approval. To support. Any discussion? Start with Terry. Yes. 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 Okay, we'll move on to public comment. Mr. Turner, you have three minutes. So we've done it. We've done we it have. a couple times. It was much more consistent the entire period through. And just to give you one as far back as that for you, the night you're not going to be moved. Just the bookcases that, that need to be moved, rolled? Yes, yes. I mean, that's, I mean, that's preparation. Even I don't think we have to touch it. There's more room in just that student section of what we have right here. And the seating is as well, and then as far as the technology, we have the same technology that we have in here. The only thing we don't have necessarily are the cameras that are set up in this room, but we do have cameras that are available on the stand that could be used. So you're saying that the audience's chairs are more comfortable, so that's about... Well, we'll take it under side from Dave, thanks. <laughs> Strongly encouraged. Strongly encouraged. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, we've done a few, and then we used to host um, the um, fair board meetings in here. Yeah. Uh, no more public comments. Board member comments for which no action may be taken at this meeting. Okay, and I have a motion to move to executive session. Uh, do I need to read this? Yeah. Uh, moved, or let's see. Move to exec executive session exempt material under Section 8H of the Open Meetings Act in regard to attorney client privilege. I move. Uh, Lisa? Yes. 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 Okay. I'll go to my office. Okay. I'll take this away. Okay. I took pictures of that because we're just doing the things. Yep, I got it. Thank you, sir. What?